Hello, everyone. Welcome to the importance of safety and consent at the gaming table. Uh, thank you all for coming and listening to us. This is a very important topic for all of us. I know it's incredibly sexy to talk about safety and consent. <laughs> so we, we just want to <laughs> talk about why it needs to be a conversation. Um, just to kick us off, I want to do some introductions. My name is Ian E. Muller. I go by Ravnos on the internet. I am the founder of Gehenna Gaming. We are a horror TTRPG company that focuses on safety and consent in horror, tabletop gaming, and inclusivity in gaming. And I'm just going to hand it over to the rest of these people. I don't really want to keep talking about myself. My pronouns are he, him. All right. Uh, Dan Munoz, uh, pronouns he, him as well. Um, I am the, uh, the owner and CEO of Nat One Fun Productions. Uh, I also work with uh, Gehenna Gamings as their creative director. Um, I have a couple of live stream actual plays that I, I have during the week. I also have an improvisational show I have on Mondays. Uh, and yeah, I do a lot in the TTRPG space that has to do with production stuff, like you know, making videos and, and overlays and stuff like that. So. Hi, I'm Raven. Uh, I am the resident chaotic goblin of, uh, of this group. Uh, my pronouns are they, she, she, they. Please use them interchangeably. Um, I am actually newer to the tabletop space, but um, I've just dived in wholeheartedly, and I am so thankful to be here. Um, you can find me at wreck -It raven anywhere. Um, I normally play a lot of horror-based games um, and a lot of variety stuff, uh, but tabletop is where my heart is. Hello, everyone. I'm Shadi Smith-Edwards, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a main cast member from the Lovely Craftians podcast. Um, I am also a, so I'm a podcaster and streamer, recently streaming TTRPGs for the last year and a half. Um, you can find me um, either at Gehenna Gaming or Com uh, Carry On Comfort uh, Studios on Twitch or YouTube. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's me. It's wonderful to see you all. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Nick Francia, aka Nobleman Nick. I am a uh, queer Latinx TTRPG streamer. Uh, you can find me usually over on Gehenna Gaming as the production marketing manager, uh, as well as a cast member over on Devil's Luck Gaming. Awesome. Uh, so this is going to be an overview of safety tools in TTRPG space, what they are, how to use them, and more into the nitty gritty of them. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive here, but I do wanna start with just talking about what are safety tools, some examples of the ones that we do use in our games, as well as um, kind of what they mean to each of you. Dan, do you wanna start and we just go down the line? Yeah, sure. Um, I, of course, uh, with pretty much everybody nowadays at least, uh, start with the session zero to kind of clear things up about what is expected during the game. Um, there is a lines and veil sheet that can be passed around that has a huge list of phobias and things that uh, might be uncomfortable for the players. Uh, but my favorite and my, uh, I guess, most want and needed in, in games are X cards and um, kind of like the red, yellow, green cards. Uh, basically, it allows people to slow the game or stop the game when it happens in, in that moment, and uh, you're able to skip through it, slow through it, whatever is necessary for the player. Um, so, I, again, I'm a little bit newer to tabletop, but one of the, the things that I have found sitting at one of my um, Urban Shadows tables is that it is virtual, so we actually have a Zoom window open, there's a chat, um, and we have little letter codes that we use. So um, every so often our, our DM will actually throw an O in the chat with a question mark. And basically that just means, hey, are you okay? So it's checking in with our players and then we can respond with like a lowercase O just to let them know that yes, everything is okay. Um, if there is something going on, much like the, the X card, like we'll throw an X in the chat. Um, sometimes you will add context like X spiders, right? So then we know to kind of move past that. Um, another thing that I really liked was throwing an H in the chat. 
So an H in the chat means that between two players, things are getting a little bit heated and y'all are trying to throw hands. So if you are willing to throw hands with somebody, you can throw an H in the chat and if that person reciprocates, then those players are going to end up fighting. Uh, another thing that I would like to point out, um, and this is like for some players that aren't aware of how they're feeling before, like they have the pre like lines and veils and stuff like that, session zeros, there's the during obviously, which is throwing up an X card or movie controls. But there's also the aftercare session, which is you go over it with, you go over with your player as a GM and if there's anything that might not have meshed well with you and you're not sure how to put words to it, uh, there's aftercare games, um, stars wishes, um, I play a variation of it called Stars, Wishes, and Feelings um, that I like. Like I uh, worked with it on with Charm Person games, if I remember correctly. So uh, Stars is things that you liked to see, like that you really liked. Wishes is what you wish would have happened, or you wish would like to happen next. And feelings are things that might be residing over, like that you still aren't sure how to put a, uh, a name to it or phrase it, or maybe like want to talk about it a little bit more. Um, it's to help like end character bleed as well as like not carry that over. Um, I would say that it doesn't necessarily stop the character bleed, but it's something to help players keep in mind what might still be residing in them afterwards, depending on how heavy a se uh, session might have been. Yeah. And following to uh, Shade's point, I love the aftercare tool. Uh, I do what's something that's called the cooldown, uh, whereas after a very intense session or just horror gaming in general, like everyone just to take a deep breath in unison and where we officially declare that as our disconnect of role play back into the real life. And then spending a few couple minutes just talking about anything else that isn't the game, our lives, what we're doing the next day, uh, and just reconnect as human beings as it were. I really like that. Thank you. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> uh, going back to what Raven said, uh, throwing an O in the chat. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to have you all talk about is the difference between informed and implied consent. And you know, putting an O in the chat is actively asking the players, are you okay? Versus just assuming people are okay because you're not seeing an X or seeing them say, hey, can we roll this back? How, how do you feel using that? And do you, do you, have you encountered issues between the two of them? So I will say that I am lucky to be able to sit at tables that don't really use implied consent. Um, I am an avid over communicator. So the fact that there are these check-ins really does help mitigate anything that could potentially lead to a downward spiral of sorts. Um, but I also really have no issue telling people like how I'm feeling, <laughs> I really don't. Um, so if I am feeling a certain way, like I will, you know, throw up the X, I'll do whatever I need to, to make sure that like I'm okay. And I know that me as a player, like if I feel like there is someone who is being, you know, a little bit quiet because the situation is uncomfortable, I'll end up asking them privately like, hey, are you okay? Like, what do we need to do? Um, so I think it's really important, honestly, to just check in. Um, implied consent, um, unless explicitly given, should never really be the thing that you fall on as consent as a whole. I'd, uh, I'd like to follow up on that because I, I really like that you said that you, even if you are not the GM, you are not the one that is kind of tailoring the situation, you can still take the opportunity to be like, hey, is everybody okay? You don't have to be the one at the helm. You can be a player in that situation where you jump in and you say, hey, we good? Are we all good? You know, maybe that was a little rough. I saw that maybe you're acting a little bit different. It really helps, of course, if you're playing with people that you know or people that you've been around before and experienced those different situations that they can, their, you know, their facial expressions or maybe the, how they're acting. Um, that all comes into play as well. But I do like, yeah, I like the fact that you definitely don't have to be the person that is actively running the game or actively, you know, uh, putting forth the, the scary things or, or whatever might be happening in the moment to check on other people. Do you want to know the best thing about that? It's free. <laughs> sure. It's free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Before um, we I'm, keep going, I just want to see if either of uh, Shade or Nick have anything right. to add to this topic. Oh yeah, I would also say that like uh, following up with the uh, facial expressions and like kind of knowing, uh, even if you don't know who's at the table, it's uh, kind of important uh, to keep an eye on all your players. Uh, sometimes, like for instance, a lot of people assume uh, that people are going to get irate or upset when something bad happens to them, or if they're triggered, it's gonna be a very violent reaction when sometimes it might be the actual opposite. Like uh, panic attacks don't actually look like what people assume is panic. It could also be silence. It could be retreating. It could be stopping playing entirely. And it's knowing that like, hey, something's wrong here. Or something's different or there's a change. Sometimes people don't notice that. Sometimes they're caught up with the story. Um, so it is important for everyone to, to take on the role of making sure everyone's okay in that regard. I think the only thing I want to add, because I, I feel like all my other co-panels have really outlined it perfectly well, is that in games not even that are just horror, uh, you might find yourself as a GM uh, forgetting to do those check-ins. And uh, sometimes mistake happens, and you can't really uh, beat yourself over it too much. You have to just keep rolling and then remember, hey, uh, do better next time. Or make sure to ask that check-in because even after a really happy session, uh, someone might be feeling a sort of way. Um, you're not sure. And even when someone hits you with the I'm fine, just take it under consideration. You don't have to force the issue at all. Um, but keep it in the back of your mind because that could be an emotion that your player doesn't want to let spill forth. I think it's important to remember that just because you've had a session zero or that you've had, you have your lines and veils established doesn't mean that a player might discover something new that they didn't even realize bothered them yeah, during absolutely. a session. Absolutely. And doing those check-ins and having aftercare, but also making sure that you have in informed consent as you're going really will help mitigate disastrous situations from building up. Um, the next topic I want to uh, direct directly to Sade first. <laughs> oh my God, okay. <laughs> uh, because <By> all <laughs> uh, you have been on the Lovely Craftians for some time. It's a fantastic podcast if anyone hasn't listened to it. Um, and this is really about uh, one of the big things that I hear when I talk to people about using safety tools is they're like, oh, well, I've gamed with the same group of people for 20 years. I don't need to use safety tools. We, we all know each other perfectly. And that is absolutely not the case. And uh, you have a lot of experience gaming with the same group for an extended period of time. So I wanted to ask you to touch on that. Um, hmm. I would say that we started taking on more safety tools and taking it on a little bit more seriously at the beginning of uh, season three, um, just because we were starting to delve further into a horror that would be considered psychological or layered, or like, oh, we are knowing the same characters for a very long time, um, so if something bad happens to them or something happens in a way we didn't expect, it feels like loss. It actually feels like you lost someone or, or you might lose someone as we're getting close to clearly finale, because Call of Cthulhu is not forgiving um, <laughs> to characters at all. Um, so we started implementing uh, a lot of safety tools um, at the, the beginning of three, and it was a lot of like checking in with each other and I would say we started fully like getting into it um, in season four um, when we started uh, getting into writing a little bit more, uh, I guess, connecting with the characters more often, digging into their backstories and pulling stuff out that was meant to hurt the characters, like in a, in a creative way. <laughs> like we were fine, but like the characters were like, oh, this, this hurts a little bit. Um, and I would say I definitely trust them a, a lot more now that we were able to implement them all together more often and we uh, put together the aftercare session as well. And being very careful of like, hey, this was really heavy. Um, let's do a post-mortem after like a week to see how we're still feeling, to be honest. Like, cause you might be okay now. You might not be okay two days from now though. Cause things like, you're gonna start thinking about those characters, what you said, maybe what they said before, it's okay. Let's talk about it afterwards and let's like set a date maybe to talk about it later, which I very much appreciate because some things just settle and you don't, especially uh, when it comes to like something bad happening to character you didn't expect. But yeah, I, yeah, it's a, I trust them now um, for sure beyond, um, especially as we implemented more tools. 
Yeah, and I think uh, something that can get lost in playing with the same group after a while, because you know what does happen. Uh, oftentimes in the TTRPG space, you're moving through so many people at once. Uh, you are constantly like, okay, this is a new person. I have to do safety tools. I have, you know, you have that mental checklist. But if you keep playing with the same group of people, uh, from my experience, is that there's sort of an expectation that what was once good should stay good. And the problem is when that happens, if someone starts to get uncomfortable, they might feel uncomfortable because now they're your close friend and they think that they've set some sort of expectation for, uh, for them to you. And now they don't want to bring that up now that's changed. So it's, I think it's even more imperative to keep talking about that and keep checking in because that person now doesn't want to disappoint you or wants to keep things good between you because now you have the added effect of friendship in it. I always say it's better to be preemptive with these things. Um, speaking from a, a point of a game might, e might not even be horror-based, let's say Dungeons & Dragons, for instance, but you want to implement horror into it. If you've been with a party for a long time, and let's say, for instance, it's, it's just been regular D&D &D up until a certain point where it's like, well, I kind of want to dive a little bit more into the horror aspect before just implementing it with the group that you are comfortable with, that you play for years with and everything like that, that's a perfect opportunity for you to reach out to those individuals, even though you play with them for so long, to say, hey, I want to try and implement this. You're not giving away the story. You're not telling them exactly what's gonna happen, but you can definitely reach out and say, hey, I wanna implement this into the story. How do you feel about these situations? Are you cool with it? Are there things about this specific situation that might set you off? These are great times to reach out to the group that you've been with for the longest time, and they should, being that they are a long-term group, accept that without any kind of issue. Just move on with it and be like, yeah, yeah, we're totally cool. Or, hey, actually, why don't we don't, you know, not do that, and let's try something else. You know, what else do you have in your handbag of stuff? And I will say, like, from the games that I've played, um, there is one group in particular where, because the themes of the campaign are so grotesque, um, there are content warnings prior to that session. Mm -hmm. So if there are issues, we find out early in the day and we can actually reach out and have conversations. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, we can, we can work through it actively. And I think it's important to know that sometimes, you know, we do put a lot of ourselves into our characters. Like, I know all of my characters are a section of me. Um, and even though I am willing to like, be flexible with some of the things that happen, there are some things that have been brought up that I didn't even know was an issue for me until it was. Um, so I think having those clear indications prior to the session really does help a lot because I can prepare myself and if I feel like it is something that is going to trigger me or upset me, I can have a conversation openly with uh, the GM about it. Right, and if you set that standard with your players, you should have that open door policy where they should be able to come to you with any issue and it shouldn't be a, you know, a problem with it. You know, it shouldn't be like, oh, God, well, I was planning this. Now you're going to ruin my story kind of mm -hmm. thing. It shouldn't be that situation. You, yeah. should, you should be able to talk to your, your people. And, and so if you can't talk to your people like that, you need to find another route. Um, or even, you know, if it's too much, just tell them sorry. It's just, there's just no way around it. I can't, we can't continue. Or, you know, I'm going to have to drop something. Um, it's it's a it's a colloquial term. It's a term that everybody uses. Bad or no no D and D is better than bad D and D, or no TTRPG is better than bad TTRPG, and that is especially true when it comes to safety and consent. Yeah, especially in the horror realm, because there are some some very severe topics that get brought yeah, up. Yeah, big time. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good segue to the next topic, which is uh, how you how you introduce safety tools at your tables, and especially with people who may be unfamiliar with them because one thing that's important to know is that when you do tell someone about the game you want to run, it's okay if that game's not for them. And that's a, that's a really important way to go about this. But I, I want to 
starting with Dan, talk about like how you inter when you are starting with a new group or even an existing group and you want to introduce a safety tool or talk about how you're going to use them in the game. How do you go about doing that? So there are tons of online options for you to choose from when it comes to preemptive like zero session or like sit down and let's talk about this before we even get even close to started about what we're going to be doing here. Um, but me personally, um, I enjoy just thoroughly, thoroughly writing out exactly what the campaign is supposed to be about. This is what we're going to be talking about. Here are the themes. Here are some situations that may occur, some situations that will never occur, and some situations that very much have a high possibility of occurring. Now, I take those and I work with the people that, of course, I want to play with. I don't, I'm not here to shun people out the second they say, oh, they don't want to play in that world. You can totally if you want to. People come with expectations. But I like to work with people. So if, let's say, I have uh, something in the this is probably going to happen section, uh, and they say, well, I don't know, that's not really my, my cup of tea, then I can work around that because we're, we're, to we're toppling it so early on that I can use that to then rework how I'm going to implement it into the story or completely nix it, depending on the situation. So early, early nip it in the bud kind of situations. Yeah, I think as, as far as implementation goes, like I don't sit at a table or anything of that nature if I feel like there is no open and honest communication. That is my first indicator of whether or not there is going to be a, a healthy game that is played. Um, so I don't mind when people are like, hey, just so you know, X, Y, and Z is probably going to happen. Because then at least I know, right? And I, y'all don't have to do what I do, but I'm very open about my, like, my lines, my veils, all of that. Um, I think that does make for a better gaming space, but I know that not everybody has that, and that should be celebrated too, because it is not up to everybody to have to say those things. Um, but honestly, just being open and willing to communicate is the best way to implement anything in the, in the gaming space and at the table. Also, like following up with, it's essentially setting expectations, which is what was earlier said, but uh, I would say adding on to that with the consent form or with the uh, lines and veils, also just setting what the rating of the game is going to be um, is very helpful. And I didn't realize it until I saw it before where I was like, hey, especially in horror, but like it could be with anything. Um, setting it to be like, hey, PG-13, R, NC-17. Like, I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's a good vibe. Plus what the feeling of it, of what you're entering is going to be. So if you're expecting there to be heavy gore or something that's like slasher related probably, I would like to know that because I don't like that. <laughs> I do not like participating in that. If you're not sure what the game is going to be, but you want to invite people you don't know, it might be helpful to just like take a moment, take a breather and like, at least get a basic concept of what is going, to, or the pitch of what it's going to be. So you know, they know, and they can like choose if they want to be a part of it. Even if they like you or want to play with you, it just might not be this game. It's just being overly communicative and transparent about what's going on, even in that regard. That rating helped me a lot. Like being like, oh, I'm okay with up to rated R, no gore, please. Um, psychological horror, bring it on. Fuck me up. I don't care. Like you know, you know. But like, I just want to prep for that, right? Everyone wants to know what they're getting into. They don't want to go into our room blind. It's not a great feeling. I think it's something also a uh, really nice takeaway point um, is that safety tools aren't just for the players; they're for the GM as well. Uh, and something I really like about the the pitch way of form of it, and something that you know Shade just said as well. It's okay if that player's not okay with the game and that's not something you want to compromise on. You just say, hey, this isn't the game for you. And as a GM, you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't let your players, uh, when you're pitching that game, force you to change something if that's not the story you want to tell. You know? But at the end of the day, obviously, if there's no player wants to play the game you know, you're trying to tell or trying to share with them, then maybe you should probably change the game around a bit. I remember... A specific example, I was playing Monster Hearts. 
which is a pretty dramatic game, and we were running uh, a particularly very dark, gory version of it on Gehenna. Um, <laughs> and like one of the gory. yeah, and one of the things we wanted to start with, as I said, okay, how does everyone feel about cults and cannibalism? Which very heavy order, I'm sure. <laughs> And there were some people that were like, I don't think I'm okay with that. I was like, all right, this isn't for you, and that's totally fine. And we would go on to play other games, and we found that group that was okay with it. I felt so comfortable that I was able to really go hard in those themes, and I didn't have to pull my punches because we had built that trust just from day one of setting expectations that that was what was going into. That's what the game was going to be about. And ultimately... I say this every panel, safety tools are more than just safety tools, they're also calibration tools, because your game can go to amazing new heights of horror that you've never seen, and you will still feel uh, as safe and comfortable in it if you haven't used them at all. Uh, I do want to add on to something you said, because I was in that game. You were? It's also <laughs> important to, to know that you did actually, you did have to modify that game for players still in different ways because mm -hmm. Monster Hearts is very much a game about um, romance and sexuality and one of the players wasn't okay with that part of it. So we, you did have to make changes and modify things and still get to tell the story that you wanted to tell and that was really, Safety Tools allowed us to do that really well. I think just one last thing I wanna piggyback off of pretty much everything is that um, the, the safety and consent of basically the whole table is not just in the GM's hand, it's also in the other players. And it doesn't really get talked too much about because whenever you do this situation, you can of course want to pass it to your game master, that way they can tailor the experience to fit around everybody's expectations. But sometimes you may run into a situation where a player is leading into an area where another player is completely uncomfortable with. Um, and there is where you need to make sure during these introductions and during this talk and everything like that, that you, if you are running the game, that you take care and make sure that everybody is in the know of the lines and veils of the, the game. So you can't just, well, you can't, I guess, but you shouldn't. Uh, you shouldn't just have those things to your own, like, okay, I'm not going to put these things in the game. Okay, cool. And then just leave it at that you should make sure that everybody knows that here's the things that will not be in the game and also make sure you try to avoid them. Mm -hmm. So make sure your players are in the know-how too so that they don't start sliding into an area where they clearly should not be. Yep. And Raven, you talked about how comfortable you are talking about your lines and veils, and, but some people aren't. Using something like a consent form or you know just this private discussions with each player allows you to still have those conversations because you can get the information and then you can anonymize it and just say, here's our list of exactly. red listed topics. You know, these are the things that aren't going to happen. Please, if, and I will slow down if someone, if, please try to avoid them. And if you accidentally start broaching on one, we'll, we'll take a step back. Right. Nobody has to know who's afraid of spiders. If yeah. there's, yeah, nobody has to know about what may or may not mm -hmm. be a, a, a thing for you. It could absolutely just be a, hey, this is what's not going to happen. Cool? Cool. Absolutely. Uh, before we, we jump into our next topic, I do want to touch on one thing. We are all horror heads. We love horror games. We all play mostly horror games. But all of these same things apply to a, my, the My Little Pony RPG. <laughs> which does exist now, by the way. And I, I actually really want to run a horror <laughs> game in it, so we, we can all talk. Okay. But, um, <laughs> So, you know, you can apply these to the Dungeons & Dragons game you run for 12-year-olds. Absolutely. It's, it's equally important in all of those games as well, not just when you're broaching horror topics. Uh, the next thing uh, on our list really is we've talked about running games on Zoom a little bit, but introducing safety tools is a lot easier when you're all sitting at the same table. So I want to talk about the differences between using them at your home game and using them in an online game, as well as using them in a convention game. Uh, and Nick, I want to actually start with you because you've done a lot of most a lot of online gaming with Gehenna Gaming, as well as running convention games. Uh, and so, how do you differentiate how you introduce them and how you use them in those different settings? So I think it's just rip the band-aid off and just be upfront with it. 
in a con game, as soon as everyone sits down, the way that I like to lay everything out is in the middle are consent sheets. Around them are character sheets face down. I tell everyone, hey, take the consent sheet. I explain it to them, and I say, fill this out. You know, I, it's mandatory. I need to, We have a really nice itemized checklist that we use for Gehenna. If you don't have something on hand, uh, it's something you can easily Google, either from us or from a lot of other places have their own versions of consent sheets. Monty Cook. Monty Cook is, yeah, Monty Cook is the, the original. Yeah. one as well, yeah. Um, but simply, you can even just break it down to your own, the traffic light system. Green means go, I'm okay. Yellow means, you know, we can briefly go over it, but not too much detail, and red means stop. And I think the anonymous part of it is something that really needs to be said. I don't like telling people they have to put their name down. I reassure them that they don't have to because I feel when they're anonymous, they're allowed to be honest and they don't feel like they're holding the game back. Now, in a streaming sense and playing online games, um, I generally, when I, if it's a stream game and we have more of that kind of business sense, I like sending players like a contract or like a consent form. I, you know, and that it's included with the pitch. It's like, hey, are you on board? Uh, specifically, I think the board, we, the the form we send, the first question is, this is the premise, and are you on board with this? And particularly, one of the best questions at the end is, would you like the game master to follow up with anything on this, and if so, what? And that's where they can really be like, hey, this is what I really want to talk about. This is the one. Uh, part of the game that might be bothering me or this is where I think we can compromise on and honestly just introducing it you just have to like kind of strong hand it in like I've never seen a player that has abruptly told me no to safety tools but I'm sure they're out there I'm sure there are people that are very much resistant um, as I see on Twitter every day <laughs> that blah 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 uh, safety tools are ruining the uh, TTRPG uh, not get the a, Twitter yeah get Wait, off my lawn I gotta bring up the bird app, the bird app. <laughs> but um yeah, just be on it, be up, uh, straight up with it, and uh, don't take no bullshit. Be honest. Just be honest. Just, like, tell them <laughs> exactly what's going down. With streamed games, because that's kind of my, my premise. I, I play a few at-home games, but not very often, especially not horror. But stream games, I played horror, and you just have to really just throw everything on the table and say, this is what's going down. Um, you don't want to sugarcoat anything. You don't want to have anything be misconstrued. It's like, oh, I thought you said no this. Well, I didn't mean that. I meant like this, that kind of thing. Um, I love that on the paper you can ask, you know, of course, um, can you specify? For instance, like, let's say spiders, and it's like, okay, well, I don't really mean spiders. I mean, like, tarantulas especially, you know what I mean? Or I'm cool with spiders, but not like swarms of spiders, that kind of thing. So there could, could be specifics when it comes to lines and veils, and those are always good to work around as well. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. And, like, kind of just touching on that, like, we actually play a game together. Sure. And we did our session zero for Morkboard, which if you haven't checked it out, you really need <laughs> um, Because it is absolutely delightful. But, you know, I did put my lines and bells out there and our, our DM was, you know, asking questions, which I, you know, am so happy to oblige. Um, and again, I'm very open. It doesn't mean that everybody else has to be, but um, I am an over communicator um, and unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience at tables because I really started to get into the tabletop scene over the course of the last two years with this whole panorama that we <laughs> will not name. Um, so, but I did play, honestly, my first convention game last night, and it, that was amazing. Um, and a, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And it was, it was, again, very simple. Like, I had the sheet. Right, and I could say what I was okay with, what I wasn't okay with, as you know, me as my character or happening in game. So it got split between the two, um, which I think is important to differentiate. Like that you're okay with something in the game, but not involved with your character. Absolutely. Um, and it just it it really does set the precedent for the table. And even though we're gonna get into some deep dark things, like I can feel safe in this space knowing full well that nobody is going to intentionally try to hurt me. 
Uh, I just want to kind of give an example specifically about our Mark Ward game. Yeah. Um, I don't mind sharing it. I, uh, I am Catholic, uh, and I am playing a game that is very much so uh, almost anti-religious. Uh, it is, it is, uh, there's a bunch of upside down crosses and everything like that in it. Um, so my lines and veils are very clear uh, when it comes to my expectations of the game. Um, and I made it very clear when we were talking about that in the zero session that um, my, my view of it is like, you know, as long as you don't specifically go to be anti-Christianity or, or anything like that, then we're cool. Um, but I specifically also said that things that show things that are visually like, you know, a cross or something like that, or if it is like a, ch like a church, uh, a totally fine. But it's, it is very specific for me to be just as long it is as is as long as it is not anti Christianity, I'm good, um, and that was my veil. So you can see it. The specifics for that allow for the GM to tailor this the experience, while also still really being able to specifically tailor to your needs if need be. Hi. <laughs> if you have no, you're, no, you're fine. Um, this, uh, I, in terms of like digital wise, because I mostly live digital, I work digitally um, like for years now. Um, having everything in a uh, location, obviously using Discord and using other things like that, but having everything in one convenient location, such as uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, whatever it is, whatever people use to like collectively like work on the same document together, that's what I prefer. Uh, so having alliance veils and invitations is like another one. So like if there's something you would like to see happening in the game that maybe I didn't even think about, I'm like, oh cool, you want romance in this? All right, we got that, we got that, <laughs> we can send that in there. Um, if people are, are okay with it. Um, so having that and having it live, so always bringing it back up with each session just to make sure everyone remembers it, for instance. Um, and there's that, then there's also like, I always use uh, slide decks um, for all of my character sheets. Um, so everyone knows what's going on. Um, it, that's how I do it. So like I always make a template for all the characters. Usually you do Monster of the Week or Call of Cthulhu or something similar. Um, so that everything is like in a nice convenient location. So having everyone remember, except for unless they want anonymous, obviously. I'll keep that to myself. But uh, if it's like, hey, remember what people's like lines and veils were. Remember what we talked about. And also if something might come up, um, that a character had talked to me either in confidence or is written down somewhere. And I'm like, I feel like we're getting ready to broach that topic. Um, I think one of my players um, didn't say it in the lines and veils, but I know them personally. They don't like the concept of death. Um, but I found out personally next to them, near them, living it, um, so someone being lost or witnessing something happening, that's what they didn't like. But I was like, yeah, but I'm getting ready to bring you death fay stuff. Um, is that okay? Because we're gonna be diving into that. Um, and I remembered it saying that. It's, I know it's asking like, oh yeah, remember your players. Some people do not remember certain things. So having it written down, noted. Um, don't ever think that like it, your concerns are silly or like it's triggering for you. It's not like, no, I, I, don't, I don't care. Like, please communicate with me. I will hunt you down. If I find out, <laughs> not in a bad way, like, but like, I will hunt you down. It's like, hey, are you sure now? Are you sure you're sure? All right. You can tell me during, too, if it's not, or after. I, I beg my players, I beg my Please. players to tell me during the game. Mid, I don't care what we're doing, mid game, tell me to stop. If there's ever, ever a point and you think you're interrupting the game, I beg you to interrupt my game and tell me to stop or move on or, you know, avoid the situation, please. Absolutely. And if I see just, a, even if it's a little bit of discomfort, because um, I'm keen on that a little bit, like it's just like, hey, you, you, you did something a little different than you normally do. Uh, are you sure you're okay? Or I'll private message them in the middle of it. If they like, are you sure you're okay? Whether it's through like personal discord or if it's like Zoom where it's like just to that person or if it's roll 20, you can whisper. Like, you know, like there's always that element of the whisper function isn't just like, hey, only me and that person knows and we're secretly talking about something <laughs> that's like story plot related. No, it's also to like, hey, you, you, you okay? Like that was a heavy scene, you know, like, so it's just, we like always comes back around. Like over communication is extremely important and being extremely thorough. It's just being a good, uh, 
uh, storyteller, um, dungeon master, whatever it might be, um, to just make sure everyone's okay, whether it's just a little bit or if it is a heavy scene. So yeah. I had a, um, very recently, maybe about a month ago, I had a character die on a stream live. Uh, and usually when I do that, we, we, we will stop, we'll take a break, and we'll usually address it during the break, not to box stuff down. But we had just taken a break. We really couldn't take one. And so, you know, instead of, we were in a unique position. So instead of letting the audience kind of like, we close the curtain and then we adjust that, we had that conversation live on stream about how they thought about that character dying, um, what we would, how we would resolve the death moves, and how we would reborn that character, or, or how we would proceed in the story. And we had a really good conversation on stream, and it's still saved to a VOD, and you can still watch it. And I remember the player at the time afterwards being like, I'm really glad we showed that on stream, because that's something we don't see a lot. Yeah, for uh, sure. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't even a horror game. That wasn't a Kingdom Hearts game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you nailed it on the head. You, we don't see it enough. Um, there are instances where things go too far a lot. Things aren't said on stream because they're afraid of breaking their, you know, breaking the veil and like, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, the behind the curtain stuff gets put in front and stuff like that. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong in my eyes, for my stream at least, there's nothing wrong with someone saying, hey, slow down or hey, let's mm -hmm. move on or hey, let's figure this out. Let's talk. Let's move aside out of the game real quick and let's talk now if they of course want to say like hey let's go on break or hey i don't care if we just took a break let's take another break then i'm going to take another break mm -hmm. so it's going to be an issue of just like you know making sure that everybody's okay at that time but if they want to have a conversation i think that's great to be able to publicly have that conversation to show that it's okay to not be okay yeah yeah I have a, a slightly unique experience where I am a cast member on a stream show that records in studio, and Nick, I know you do now as well sometimes. I don't, I don't know if the rest of you do, so I apologize if you do, and I'm just saying, oh, I'm unique. <laughs> uh, but we, everyone on that show, in addition to enjoying TTRPGs, is an actor, either professionally or amateur, because I'm not a professional actor, nor do I play one on TV. But um, <laughs> we've agreed that if everyone on that show has bought into, even if I am getting uncomfortable, I don't want to interrupt the flow of it. So we use, we, we use under camera level hand gestures to show, hey, let's move on. Let's, let's push this sideways. And this, the storyteller for that show pays attention to all of that. So I think even in a situation where you don't want to interrupt things, it's still important to provide those tools to Absolutely. communicate. Um, we, are, we have a little bit more than 15 minutes left, so I do actually want to shift to the Q&A portion of this shortly, but I wanted to, before we do that, give any of you a chance to say anything else important you want to add. I literally only have one last thing that I would say is kind of like a, a safety tool you can use. Go on break, use breaks. Always use breaks. If you take an hour, if you play like an hour and take like a five minute break and then take like an hour and take like a five, that's cool. Or if you're like, you know, you got like a six hour game and you want to go three hours, take whatever is necessary, take breaks. Don't play an entire game through and without, especially a horror game, mm -hmm. don't play an entire game through, take a break because those are wonderful moments to get with your players, to get with other players, to get with your GM to talk about the situation at hand and really just decompress without even thinking about it. Just talking things through out of the game for that five, 10 minutes, whatever it may be, super useful for your mental health. Yeah. Um, I think it's important too to kind of just realize that everybody has different communication styles. Um, and it is, you know, up to us at the table, not just like, the GM, all of us, to really make it a point to communicate with you know each other in styles that work for them. Um, that's hard, but it's worth it because at that point you are going to be able to connect with the people that you're sitting at this table with because it is an intimate space um, to ensure that safety is upheld throughout the whole story. 
I would also say that, um, I think someone had said it earlier, but like, I don't, like as a GM and as a player, I never wanna hurt anyone. I don't think anyone, that is anyone's intention ever. Um, and it, it does, like, that's why we wanna check in with uh, both sides of the thing. Like, it's just, hey, I don't, if I hurt you, I don't care if you're worried about uh, hurting my feelings or like, hey, like, I, we're good friends and I don't want to tell them that like, hey, this thing hurt me. It's gonna build up in you if it keeps on happening. Everyone's gonna think it's okay. Um, they would prefer to hear it from you. Uh, and it, I like also not taking it too personally, even if they, they don't know when to say it or like they never really thought about it. Uh, never take it personally, ever. Um, because sometimes people are still figuring it out or have never figured it out or whatever it might be. Um, so it will hurt the longer it takes to talk about it, but at least you can have that conversation because no one ever wants to intentionally hurt someone. Like, I don't care what story I'm telling or if like, it, it, like I, I will amend, I will change, I will backpedal, I will do anything as long as everyone is having fun at the table with me because this is escapism. It's like wonderfully detailed and intense escapism sometimes, <laughs> but we're all telling a story. It's collective storytelling. We all have to make sure we're all in this together and we're taking care of each other. That's really important. Don't, don't mistake my willingness to hurt your character if they're in a dangerous situation for me wanting to hurt you. Mess is, me is up. What, <laughs> what it comes to. Mess me yeah. up. I don't think I just want to add that even taking a step back, uh, sometimes it's not about even fear. Sometimes it's not about what makes someone uncomfortable. Sometimes it's just about the topics at hand, discussions. Uh, sometimes it's about reflecting things in a good light or wanting to be culturally sensitive to topics that are at hand. Sometimes it's about wanting just to show the right side of things instead of like the stereotypical side of things. And those discussions are gonna be difficult, but they're necessary. And if you're able to have them, your players will continue to come back to your table. And even if they don't, they will have such a, a better feeling about the game going forward that you took those considerations to heart um, and that you went the whole way with them and you were able to establish that trust. Because uh, as Lady Gaga once said, uh, trust is like a, a mirror. Sure, you can try to fix it when it breaks, but you always see those motherfucking cracks. Uh, not, the, not the Lady I love Gaga. You she also said applause, applause, applause. She did. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different song, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so if anyone has questions there's a microphone over here you can walk up to and ask us questions and we will answer them but i am going to address one more thing while anyone who wants to ask a question moves uh because i'm surprised nick didn't say it or at least he alluded to it but he didn't say it outright safety tools are not there to prevent you from telling a story they're there to give you guidelines and especially in horror which we all love if you have safety tools in place, you can go that much harder into the story and the horror and the terror that you want to tell because you know the players are going to enjoy it. Well, that's a calibration. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I just want to say thank you because I actually run a D&D campaign. Like, I've just kind of started stepping into that realm, and it's a lot. But I think I was like focusing more on like the story and like trying to make sure I have enough material to work with. But the most important part is really this consent stuff, all this, all this safety, because if you're not in a safe environment, you're not gonna have fun, you know? That's, I feel like that's the biggest takeaway. Um, what I wanna ask is like, what are some like ground rules you have know, drop in like session zero that you, you try to Run through. I think that's like the one thing I didn't I didn't do with my my crew and like it, it it's it's showing you know people don't like I can see like the detraction from the players sometimes when things get a little whatever whatever but I feel like if I had some rules to like drop in there I might fix it a little bit maybe who knows but uh, for me the number one thing is like be respectful of the other people at the table like that that's a ground rule immediately and then it's gonna vary from team to you know, group to group, but for me, I always, I set ground rules of like, no, I don't want to see 
anyone being unnecessarily cruel, in, even in character, because mm -hmm. that, to me, is, is very much a, a trigger. It makes me angry. So I don't, I don't want to get angry with my player for something their character is doing. <laughs> Uh, I would say that like uh, what I've seen recently, uh, whenever I see someone like put together like a pitch sheet, like they tell during their sessions here, if they have a, like a out outline to tell their players, um, one of those things that I've seen is like house rules. So every GM is different. Every person like has a certain thing that they're okay with, um, that they go through when they talk to their players. Like this is how I run things. This is how, um, especially when it comes to safety, obviously, like this is what I would like to see from my players. So for instance, um, uh, if it's collaborative, like heavily collaborative storytelling, like, hey, call, like answer the call to adventure. Like it's just a list of things that you would like to see from your players and what you want your players to expect of you and stuff like that. And if there's anything you want to amend or change about that as well. Um, so it's like set, setting expectations for yourself as well as your players. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I'm sorry. I'll also say too, like it's never too late to pull back and reassess mm. and really like say, hey, y'all, I've noticed these things. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start implementing these things. You know, just because you started a game without necessarily having these tools in place doesn't mean that you can't put them in there at any point. Right. I th and I think the biggest thing is, is you have to make sure that you know what you want in, in the game and everything like that, and then communicate it direct as much as you possibly can to the players beforehand. Again, preemptive work goes a long way for the entirety of whatever you want to play. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot of preemptive work. And I'm telling you right now, also, reading off, like, if even, okay, swear to you, <laughs> even if you don't use a consent sheet, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not your dad. But even if you don't use a consent sheet, look it over. And it gives you so many ideas of like, oh, this could be problematic. I didn't realize I, even that this could be problematic. And then you could be like, okay, well, let me talk to my players and, and see what they think. Because you can then, because I mean, I don't know, if you're running a, a, uh, an adventure in the desert or something like that, you don't have to worry about like somebody drowning or something like that. So you don't have to necessarily bring that up. Right. But you can use that consent sheet to then tailor your experience of like, okay, guys, here's what to expect. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi there. Uh, like the previous speaker said, I appreciate all the tools you've given me in a uh, longer running campaign. I've had it for about six years now, but it, I feel like I've learned a lot. Uh, my question is, as you see, as a GM, as you see a player approaching kind of like an off-limits topic, do you find it better to cut them off hard stop or kind of, uh, you know, gently ease them away and then bring it up after the session? So it, it's definitely situational, sure. right? Obviously, it's definitely situational. The reason I say that is because you could, you could see the wheels turning maybe and you can kind of slowly roll into it or they bring up something that is already like, uh-oh, and then hard stop, hard stop. You shouldn't ever have to get to the end of a session before saying something that made somebody else uncomfortable in the moment. Um, if you want to just like, hey, change the subject, or like, you know, if you have to be aggressive, be like, hey, hold, stop, stop, <clears throat> hold on, <laughs> hold on. Yeah, yep, yeah. <laughs> yeah, do it, do it. Don't be afraid, <laughs> don't be afraid to be the person that other people need you to be. I, I just kind of want to add, like, you can use, like, red cards mm -hmm. and yellow cards mm -hmm. if you don't necessarily want to say, hey, sure. stop. Yeah. You can literally just have that card and be like, eh, mm, <laughs> and keep it moving. You know what I mean? And if there are questions, you can always take a break and you can always explain it. You know, like, there is somebody in the party who is very adverse to having these things discussed. Um, so, and, and I think it's important to understand, like, you, even though you are leading the game and you are the storyteller, you're still kind of a player, right? Because you have to kind of pick up on what your players are doing and reassess. So don't count yourself out for using the same tools that you're giving your players. Got it. Thank you so much. Yes. That was
was actually also my question, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to bring up also, I know it's nuanced because I don't know how many people actually stream their games here versus people that are watching, but um, you know, sometimes red cards or, or somebody might miss chat or something like that. A lot of times we play with cameras on. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the best way to go about it is just throw up that X yep. and just be like, like also, you know, make sure you're moving and, and throw up that X. Also, if you are playing over Zoom or I think pretty much any video chat platform, they, one, the, the host has the ability to mute people. <laughs> you can just be like, nope. It's like, nope. <laughs> yeah. Hey, y'all. Hey, honey. Hi. I know y'all mostly know me, but um, two things. Thank you again so much for this panel. It's incredibly informative, and I have the utmost respect for all of you because this is an incredibly vulnerable topic, and the fact that you bake it into your professional lives is just mind-blowing to me personally. Um, Second thing that I wanted to mention really quickly before my question was love the hat game on display. <laughs> yo, yo, and yo. then, so, my actual oh, question... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, my actual question does have to double back to that whole professionalism thing. So, obviously, I'm not a professional entertainer like you all are, but I see the value in these safety tools, especially in this day and age where a lot of managers and leaders are telling us, like, oh, bring your full authentic self to work. But it's like, I've never felt comfortable doing that because I've never felt safe at work. I've always felt like I've had to don a mask while I'm in the workplace. So I guess I'm curious, like, of the safety tools that you've employed in your game sessions, do you think any of those could be applied in your, uh, if you to have a professional life outside of entertainment, like, are there any safety tools? That is yes. another panel. I yes. wish. I wish. <laughs> but I, yes. wish. I wish I could force God. every employer on the planet to hand you a consent form on your first day right? of work. Right. Can you imagine if HR just came like walking up to you and it's like, "Hey, I know you're new here. I would love for you to fill this out so that way we can actually make a really great workplace for you." Yeah. Anytime yeah. your boss comes up to you with like a sexual uh, like harassment <laughs> thing or whatever, just hold up a red card. You'll be fine. <laughs> so. Funny enough, uh, this is actually a real thing that's being applied in certain areas. So I work for, uh, of my actual day job, I work for a university of medicine and something that they're implying for the whole college is that students actually have to go to mandatory counseling sessions. And we hear mandatory and we think, well, sh you shouldn't have to force them. But that the thing about it is that it erases one of the biggest problems that I think are in work HR is this stigmata that we have that if you have an issue, that you should just suck it up and not go and not bring it to anyone's attention. And the fact that we make them go to these students, go to these counseling, especially for such a stressful job like any field of medicine, they're kind of forced to come in and be like, okay, well, if I'm here, I might as well say what's on my mind. And uh, that funding has really helped to kind of bring the voice of the students and like what should be, you know, future leaders in that industry. Uh, to the forefront, and I think that's really a great initiative. Hey, darling. Hey. Um, so I would say that it's something that I would like to see. Um, it's something that I do try to practice whenever I've been a manager or when I'm talking to someone, and I try to be as transparent and vulnerable as I can. Um, there's been times when I have, and it's hit me in the face um, because people suck sometimes, um, but it is to like if it's like a group of other for instance i'm a designer um they all are receptive of it um honesty is important um sure uh but depending on who what company you're with how they run things how long they've been running to and like they might be set in their ways it's very similar to um someone had bought up before like if you were in a campaign for a very long time you feel weird trying to start over again uh, but it's different when it's like a TTRPG group of friends versus like you've been doing this for years and a new person comes in and you're trying to impose their ways. But it might be a better way. Uh, regardless, it's something like, hey, like this is hurting a lot of people. Maybe we need to reevaluate. Um, I would say the smaller the team, the better. Um, sometimes they have like pods in a, in a company where like, oh, five to ten people. Uh, you can change, you can make a change in that regards. But if it's like higher up command where it's like, you gotta, you all have to kind of put in the work together in order for people to be heard. Um, it's hard sometimes. I've seen it work before, obviously. Mm. You've done it before actually. 
Um, but yeah, it's all possible. It's just a matter of time. Thank you all so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to say one more point that I feel like needs just to be blatantly said. Um, a lot of TTRPGs, the GM and players aren't enemies. When you go play Dungeons and Dragons, you're not fighting the DM. You are both telling a story together. You are on each other's side. The GM wants to make sure that the players have the best experience possible. And the players should also take the GM uh, thoughts and hopes into consideration. You know, just like one of my biggest pet peeves, but it's also kind of like an issue for me, is I hate when I'm, as an NPC, or playing one where I'm trying to give information or trying to have a talk, and I get interrupted uh, because of personal... Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Uh, because of personal issues, you know, I've been always equated being talked over as being devalued. And so that's something I actually bring to my players. I'm like, hey, like if I'm trying to deliver information, I don't interrupt you. Please don't interrupt me, because uh, that's just a respect thing. And uh, yeah, the GM and the players aren't enemies. Thank you all for tuning in, listening, and I hope that this was incredibly helpful for you.